Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here for what promises to be a very exciting conversation. If the size of the room is anything to go by, there is already a lot of interest in the India story. It's a packed audience here at the World Economic Forum's 53rd annual meeting, where India is certainly making its presence felt on the promenade. I don't know how many of you have taken that walk, but the promenade basically dominated by, of course, uh, India and Indian companies. Uh, just for context, the conversation that we intend to have here is to really understand the India opportunity. Uh, while at the World Economic Forum in Davos, a lot of the conversations are around global growth, and there is no consensus yet on whether the global economy is going to head into a recession. If it is, will it be a mild one? Will it be a hard landing? I think there is consensus on one story, and that is the India story. And that is what we're here to talk about, uh, from resilience, which has been the story over the past 12 months to resurgence. What is the roadmap for that going to look like? Uh, we are proud here on CNBC TV 18 to partner with the World Economic Forum to bring to you uh, this conversation here. We've got a very special set of guests joining us. The IT and Telecom Minister, Mr. Ashpani Veshnav, Ms. Smriti Irani, the Minister for Child, Women, Development and Minority Affairs, and of course, the Chief of Tata Sons, N. Chandrasekharan. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before I get started, again, for context, uh, what are the big mega trends that global investors and domestic investors are looking at when they look at India? Uh, consumption, it is going to be perhaps the largest market on the strength of the fact that we are today uh, the world's most populous country. Uh, it could perhaps also be the workforce of the world because we have a very young uh, population at this point in time and that's the expectation and the assumption and the estimates that many are making. And of course, the other uh, big trends that India could capitalize on, digitalization, and we've made inroads on that on the back of the India stack. What will that mean, not just for the domestic market, but also in terms of taking this global is going to be the question. And also how digitalization opens up the market in terms of access to credit, access to finance, the spending and borrowing behavior of the Indian consumer. And finally, the big energy transition. India has also uh, put together fairly ambitious goals as far as energy transition is concerned. It has its challenges, but it also throws up opportunities. So those are going to be the areas of conversation uh, that I intend to take forward here with the ministers. Minister Vaishnav, let me start by talking to you. As I said, there is no consensus on where global growth is headed and where the global economy is headed. Where there is consensus is that globalization as we knew it has changed. There is a reshaping uh, of the world that's taking place driven largely by geopolitics, which is now dictating how geoeconomics is going to work. So I want to understand from you, how is the Indian government looking at the multipolar world today? India's role in it, and specifically uh, in terms of <coughs> the roadmap to be able to get to whether it's five trillion or ten trillion. Where do we, where do you believe we stand on the reform roadmap? How much more work needs to be done? Thank you, Shireen. Um, India has approached this entire transition, which is happening in the world in multiple on multiple dimensions. One, the first dimension is to make sure that India's economy is resilient. There is a good, consistent six to eight percent growth rate for a complete decade. It's not just one year or two year kind of thing. The thought process is to, uh, the thought process and the policy framework which follows is for a complete decade, six to eight percent growth with very moderate inflation. The second dimension is when the world is looking for resilient supply chains. And uh, as you said in your opening uh, statement, India has a very young population. So how do we attract large number of uh, supply chain participants to India, how do we make it resilient? How do we use our research and development capabilities? And third part, of course, the energy transition as well as the digital stack. So I'll cover all the three points. Mm -hmm. um, when the pandemic hit and the whole world was going through a very big crisis, which was humanitarian crisis as well as, a, as, well as an economic crisis, there were two approaches followed by various governments. The first approach was followed by so many countries was send out checks, make sure people get money in their hands. They consume and that consumption will lift the market. There was a whole lot of liquidity pumped in. The combined balance sheets of US Fed, uh, European, uh, European Bank and Japanese uh, Central Bank. The combined increase in balance sheet was about 9 trillion US dollars. That created a very quick sugar rush kind of growth, but it also brought with it unprecedented inflation. And that inflation is not going to go away so easily. It takes a time because pushing liquidity is easy. 
taking it out is very difficult and it's always very painful. On the contrary, India adopted a very pragmatic approach. Fiscal space that any country would have is always limited. It's always constrained. There is no unlimited capital in the world. Anybody can give those MMT theories, but that's bunkum. Don't believe that. Capital is always scarce. Capital is always limited. How do you use the capital that you have? That's the choice that Prime Minister Modi ji made. He made a choice that very focused consumption consumption and support to the most vulnerable groups, vulnerable sections of the population. Mm -hmm. So about 800, 800 million people got limited financial aid, plus <laughs> free food for almost third year now. So that was one very important part. Vaccination, free vaccination program. Again, 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion doses in the first 14 months. By now, we have crossed 2.1 billion doses and completely done on a digital platform. The most important piece of this decision making that Prime Minister Modi ji made was with limited and focused consumption, focused on the vulnerable sections, he put entire capital of the country into investment in infrastructure. Now investment in railways, last year the capex was 23 billion US, this year the capex is, this fiscal which ends on 31st March, the capex is going to be of the order of 26 billion US. Uh, same is the story in railway, in highway, in power transmission. That increases the productivity of the country and gives us the long-term growth potential of the country improves. It's, uh, it's resulting into huge employment generation. Today the country is adding on, a, on an average 1.5 million people into formal uh, jobs every month. So that kind of, sto those decisions have shaped the country's destiny over the last few years and that has put us on a very consistent growth path of 6 to 8 percent. India is used to a inflation rate of 5 to 7 percent because large part of energy is imported. So having inflation today at 5.8, 5.9 percent, that's the latest print. That's very moderate. So high growth, moderate inflation, this we were able to achieve because Prime Minister took very pragmatic and a very focused approach. So I just want to come in on the point that you made as far as the divergence, as far as the fiscal approach was concerned. While we did see the world move towards great degree of stimulus, and that has led to, as you now point out, a high inflation in flight, inflation at multi-decadal highs, and now a new era of high interest rates as well, posing a big challenge for central bankers across the world. We've, of course, seen in India interest rates move up as well. So fiscal consolidation is going to continue to be a key priority for the Indian government going forward? One very important part of this entire decision making was Prime Minister ensured that the fiscal policy and monetary policy they work in tandem. There are so many examples in the world I wouldn't take any names where the fiscal policy was going in one direction and the monetary policy was going in another. We, our central bank didn't have to reduce, drop the interest rates like a brick, didn't have to increase the interest rate like a balloon. It was a very moderate, very balanced view of things. So our central bank today is in a very good position with a good balance sheet of the central, of the central government. Our uh, central government's liabilities are just about 52% of the GDP and GDP growing nominal at 11-12% uh, is a very good situation to be in. So I think, yes, fiscal consolidation is a very important priority. But what is important is we have to look at growth as the primary driver, moderate inflation as the primary decision point, and combined, uh, combine the fiscal and monetary policy to create, continue that momentum for next 10 years. Well, I'll come back to you in just a second, sir. And I will get to Ms. Irani as well, but I want to get the private sector's voice in. So let me come to uh, N. Chandrasekharan. Uh, Chandra, you know, uh, Mr. Vaishnav spoke here about capex and for the last several years now it has been the heavy lifting that the government has done in terms of pushing infrastructure pushing government capex and that really has provided the philip as far as growth is concerned the big question is when is private capex going to take off are we at that inflection point at this point uh, is it another six months out 12 months out i mean you know you have uh, from the house of tatas a view from steel to uh, to uh, consumption to digitization at this point in time what's the indication that you get in terms of the heavy lifting that the private sector is likely to do in capex to push growth? I think uh, 
I'll make a couple of more comments to support the view expressed by the minister. Um, not only the uh, debt to GDP is currently at 52 percent. Just after the pandemic, it is 52 percent from a decade ago of 78 percent. So we're in, a, we're in a much, much better position today than 10 years ago. So <clears throat> overall, I think our uh, balance sheet and our, uh, even if you take the uh, private sector, overall private sector debt, debt to equity ratio is 0.5. Mm -hmm. So we are in a very, very strong wicket. Now coming to the uh, investments, uh, we run a large uh, group with uh, portfolio across B2B, B2C, um, industrial businesses, consumer businesses, tech businesses, traditional businesses. And the consumption that we are seeing is just fantastic, actually. We are not only seeing it in the urban areas, we are seeing it in the rural areas. In fact, the consumption we are seeing in tier four towns for even discretionary items like electronics and jewelry is higher than what we see in tier one towns. So the consumption is very, very strong. We have been seeing that for the last few years and we have seen it in the first half of the year. Last year we delivered a growth of 25% on a group wide basis. And this year, that is the year ending March, the first half we have already seen 19% growth in all likelihood will be 22-23% growth. So I think the consumption-led growth is very strong. And with the infrastructure spending that's being done by the government, will definitely add to this as a tailwind. Coming to the business uh, um, investments in capital, I can talk for our group to start with. I think we have a very, very huge uh, capex outlay between steel, auto, electric vehicles, renewable energy, batteries, electronics, um, and a host of other businesses, our capital commitment for the next five years is $90 billion. So <clears throat> I don't know where this fear that private sector will not come in is coming from, but at the end of the day, private sector takes time because we can't just announce an outlay. Government can decide that we are going to make an outlay of $20 billion towards this, and then they can work out the plan. We, we can't do that. We have to make a business case. We've got to go to the board. We've got to get a spreadsheet. We've got to see what is the IRR, what is the ROE, what is the ROC. Okay, all of this takes time. But I think the opportunity is huge. Opportunity is huge, and I think this 68% growth, um, at the low end, at 6%, we will achieve $20 trillion by uh, 2047. At the high end, at 8%, you'll achieve $30 trillion. So the number will be somewhere in between. And uh, so I think the opportunity is, uh, is real and uh, private sector will come in definitely. You know, since you talk about the opportunity, I want to connect what we heard from Minister Vaishnav uh, and link that back to you. In this era where one of the mega trends that everyone here in Davos is talking about is the change as far as globalization is concerned, also how geopolitics is reshaping uh, globalization. Friend shoring, near shoring, these are terms that are coming up practically in every conversation. I know you believe firmly that we should not uh, follow the argument of China plus one. It must be an India plus one strategy that we must adopt and take forward. What does that mean exactly? Can I take a couple of minutes? For yes, this? please, okay. please. <laughs> so, um, see, I, I believe, uh, I just want to make this point clearly. There are three global transitions that are happening. This is for every country. Uh, developed or developing. First one is a digital or AI, I call it AI transition. The digital transition is, is, you know, is a very broad term. Second is the energy transition. And the third is <clears throat> supply chain transition, geopolitical transition, whatever it is, all the rebalancing we are talking about. And everything else we talk is all within these three. India is uniquely positioned in all the three. On the digital transition, the reason we are uniquely positioned is because we've got a fantastic tech sector. We've got a huge talent pool. I mean, the number of tech graduates pass out in India is the highest, and not comparable to any other country in the world. 
you can combine multiple countries, still they won't match the number of graduates we pass out. Third, in the last five, six, or a decade, we have demonstrated that we can leverage technology and do developmental projects and public delivery at scale. And you know, this was most exemplified in the COVID handling. This has to be seen not only as a technology transition, I call it an attitude transition. What has happened in India? The mindset and attitude has changed. Every other country went for a COVID or a, uh, for a COVID, a Pfizer or a Moderna. India in the past would have run helter skelter and see how to get a Pfizer or a Moderna. But in this situation, in the peak of COVID, the country had the guts to say that we will do it alone. I mean, there is something to be said about that. And that attitude combined with the example of large-scale digital transformation projects. I mean, we built the whole app on the fly to, to, to vaccinate 1.3 billion people. We were all in a call every Monday evening, 7 to 8 o'clock. Business and, and, and government. So that's why the digital transition, we are extremely well-placed. Energy transition, we are well-placed because we are probably the only nation of scale where two-thirds of our growth for the next 25 years is going to come. So all our, our energy per capita is the lowest in the world. So it will increase. The amount of energy we are going to consume is so much. And all of this is new energy. So we are not replacing the, 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 the bad energy. We are creating new energy for development. And to do this transition in when there is growth, all of us who are in business know growth fixes every problem. You can have any problem. It will all be fixed by growth. I always say the priority should be, three priorities should be growth, growth, growth. Yes. And I think we have that opportunity to make the transition beautifully than any other nation. The third one, the question that Shirin asked is India Plus. I think it is not about replacing somebody. The world needs resilience. Resilience has to take precedence over efficiency. Over the last 50 years, we have driven efficiency beyond belief. Mm. So now we have to go back to being effective first, then put efficiency second. So the India plus is for India to take the lead, to build the supply chain is ecosystem. It's not one, one person's game. Nobody can do it alone. We need partners. We need to work with other countries. We need to work with companies, US companies, Western companies, other companies who are willing to work with you on a transparent basis. So India plus, when I say that, I mean India takes the lead and builds this ecosystem so that we become an alternate, resilient supply chain for the world. It is not about replacing somebody. Well, th th thank you. Thank you for, for explaining what you mean by India plus. Uh, and I think this, again, is an issue that is being debated at this point in time, that as more and more countries like India uh, move towards creating these ecosystems, move towards creating their own supply chains, will it have an impact on inflation in the long term? But that's matter for another debate at another time. Minister Irani, let me address the issue of inclusive growth with you. Because as Mr. Chandrasekharan pointed out, growth addresses many problems. But the point of inclusion also needs deliberate choices to be made. And that's what I want to understand from you. The work that's already been done, what more can we expect now on being able to create a social protection net, on being able to ensure that the widening income inequality, uh, that gap reduces, is bridged as well? I think if I am permitted to reflect in the eloquence of Chandra, there are two, three things that I would like to take forward from what he said. Firstly, what happened in the pandemic is that tenacity of tech met the audacity of administration. <laughs> And that is what India has said to the rest of the world. That's it. And when you talk about inclusive growth, when you talk about social security, what the prime minister has done is that he has re-strategized how you look at welfare. And through his policies, and the only part that I'll defer from um, the eloquence of Chandra is that there is no shotgun pronouncement of outlays. There is a strategic pathway that is designated before the money is put to the number or the plan. 
So when I talk about social security, as you've so pronounced it, Prime Minister Modi looked at it from a social investment point of view, and that is a reorientation in governance that hasn't happened before. How did it play out? Chandra speaks about the consumption levels in entire four levels of our mm -hmm. country. How did that consumption get fueled? You have doorstep delivery of free food to 800 million people, thereby somewhere conserving their consumption capacity and their purchasing power then gets either conserved or repurposed somewhere else. Apart from food, what you have done for uh, a billion plus of your populace, and especially for those who are marginalized, those who are poor, is protect their pharmacological needs in a pandemic. You have delivered two billion doses of vaccine. And that is why I said that the tenacity of tech met the audacity of administration. As he said, the easiest thing for India to do would have been um, somewhere a victim of the compulsion of the alacrity with which the pandemic was spreading, that there would have been many pressures that a government faces that import that vaccine. And it takes a lot of political strength to withstand that pressure and belief in the capacity of Indian industry to rise to that occasion, knowing well that in an time when global supply chains are choked or shut down, your industry has the capacity to fulfill your need domestically and not only fulfill a need, but also ensure that jobs are kept secure. And that is what the India story is. And again, extending from what Chandra says, why do I believe in the India plus one story? You, Shireen, began this entire discussion about how globalization is getting redefined. And now when we talk about the India story, we say we now reflect the Modi ethos of human-centered globalization. That when many our countries were devoid of pharmacological help, when they were struggling to get their needs of PPE suits or vaccines met, India knew that there are many countries with their back to the wall. We did not commercially exploit that urgency of many our societies we were still humane enough to supply pharmacy needs of many a countries at times at no cost and at times at just about the cost of production. And we did it not only out of a governance plan, we did it out of an Indian plan. As Chandra said, there are many industry captains in this very room who are on call 24 seven. We've told the world, especially at Davos, we never close for business. <laughs> but we were at business, both of governance and manufacturing, especially when the world had shut down. And that is the potential of India that needs to be pronounced from every corner. We did not profit from your misery. We were humane in our approach. We were resilient in protecting our supply chains, and we still served a common global cause. Well, thank you very much for, for that uh, uh, very eloquent uh, uh, insight into the audacity of administration and, of course, the, the convergence with technology. But, Mr. Vaishnav, let me address the issue of opportunity and the roadmap ahead. Uh, one of the big things that everyone here is talking about is the PLI schemes. The government has announced and rolled out PLI schemes across 13 different sectors. There are different stages of evolution at this point in time because the dates of rollout were different. The question now is... Uh, in light of the success of the schemes that have already been rolled out, does the government feel more emboldened and confident to do more, to include more sectors uh, under the PLI schemes? And for existing schemes, for instance, like the FAME scheme, for the benefit of our viewers who don't know, uh, the scheme that was brought in to try and uh, accelerate the growth of electric mobility, uh, the sun sets on many of those schemes in the next year or so. Uh, will the government like to continue? Because investors investing will also want predictability and a roadmap of what incentives will look like. Uh, are we likely to see an extension of the existing subsidies and are we also likely to see new PLI schemes and new incentives being brought in? So PLI scheme has proved out to be very successful both for the government as well as for the industry. <clears throat> in terms of government to what Mr. Chandra said, we don't put money just like that. We do <laughs> have our calculations. We do economic IRR, you do financial IRR. So it's... No, uh, I was not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying you can take the decision up front. Uh, uh, of course, uh, so I mean, just take PLI as an example. The outlay for PLI was about 24 billion US. Uh, the additional taxes that we are going to get just from the mobile PLI is going to be of that order. 
So just one mobile PLI pays for the entire PLI that we have for all the sectors. Combined together, the uh, actual tax contribution, additional incremental GST, uh, and incremental income tax is going to be significantly more than the outlay that we put for it. What has happened is PLI has, PLI first brought the assembly to country, right? Over a period of time, over a period of last one and a half years, the assembly is now going deeper and wider. Mm. Component uh, supply chain is shifting to India. Indian homegrown companies are coming up with components as well as uh, many critical parts of the supply chain. And that is what is very, very uh, encouraging. That is what is really good. We believe that, uh, for example, this iPhone 14 is uh, made in India, right? And now quite a few parts of it, for quite a few components of it are now getting made in India. So that makes a huge difference. It is adding jobs. It is creating uh, new economic opportunities. Are we likely to do more PLIs? Yes, there are many more PLI items in the work. For example, hardware IT mm -hmm. uh, for servers, for laptops, for PCs. That is another piece to be uh, still in works. There would be, this approach has worked well, so there would be more uh, sectors that we consider. Uh, there will be more sectors. And you, you brought up that iPhone, uh, and yes, we have seen App Apple, uh, through its partner Foxconn, shift a large part of its manufacturing now to India, including uh, assembling the iPad, which is now likely to take place in India as well. Is there also a recalibration in position and strategy uh, in the context of what we heard from Chandra? And I know that just today, apparently, uh, the, the government has cleared investments from 13 companies that are linked to the Apple ecosystem so that they can assemble the iPad in India. Is there also a recalibration of strategy to say uh, it doesn't matter if the money comes in from China or anywhere else as long as it is creating jobs in India? Of course, we do follow the trusted uh, uh, supply chain uh, concept in multiple sectors, including electronics and telecom. But what I would like to say is that uh, people today, as Mr. Chandra said, uh, people want effective and resilient supply chains. The cost efficiency, which was driving the entire globalization, that is no longer the sole factor. Today, supply chains have to be anti-fragile. Supply chains have to work whatever be the magnitude of, pen, uh, magnitude of global disruption. So combine all those factors and the experience that we have had in the last few years, there would be many more uh, supply chain partners who are looking at alternate geographies, alternate uh, places. And India is, of course, a very important destination. There is a stability of laws. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has shifted. Uh, has uh, deleted about 1,500 archaic laws from the statute book. About 20,000 uh, compliances have been removed from the compliance framework that we have. And a lot more simplification is happening. The reforms that Prime Minister did in the telecom sector, mm -hmm. today a telecom tower, which used to take seven, eight months for a permission, uh, 80, 70, 80 percent of the cases, it happens instantaneously, as in instant, as in zero zero times. So it's like you press your enter button, make the payment, and you get your permission. It's the, as simple as that. So things are improving on sector after sector. There is simplification. Space has been open to private investment. Mm. There are young startups who are now launching satellites. It's, it's, a, it's a totally totally new story in the country. Green hydrogen hub, uh, the hydrogen mission, which has been approved uh, a yeah. couple of weeks back. Uh, already we have 174 gigawatt capacity from non-fossil fuels, which is 42% of India's total energy. Mm. So it's a, it's a very consistent, multidimensional, very resilient, very well thought through approach towards it. Chandra, if I can address the issue, we talked a lot about the domestic opportunity uh, and what that means both for domestic investors like yourselves as well as global investors. But I want to shift the focus to talk about India's export ambitions because for us to be able to get to the kind of growth that we are talking about, whether it's 26 trillion or 30 trillion, exports will need to be a significant growth driver. Of course, the global macros are more challenging at this point in time. But what do you believe uh, the road ahead needs to be? And I ask you this also in the context of uh, you being in charge of the Business 20 as part of the G20, and India, of course, has taken on the presidency of the G20. How crucial will it be for India to ink more FTAs, for India to uh, ink more bilateral agreements uh, to really push and accelerate exports going forward? I think um, 
exports is a huge potential for us to really realize the full potential of the country. We need the uh, domestic consumption continuing to fire. We need the rural to fire, urban to fire. We need the exports to fire. And uh, <clears throat> our opportunities are, uh, frankly speaking, is mind-bogglingly broad. Um, sector by sector, we can create huge opportunities. If you take exports, if we get the uh, manufacturing story right, for which there are a lot of uh, steps being taken, the government PLI, the unique opportunity of the global supply chain presenting itself for India to take the lead for the India plus one opportunity will play out in every sector. It will play in electronics. It can potentially play in semiconductors. It can play in um, pharmaceuticals. It can, play, it can play in food. It can play in across sectors it will play. So I think the export opportunity is huge and it'll, it's a natural, um, natural success that will come once we create the capacity. See, even if you take, for example, we decide to put a semiconductor firm. India will not go into the... Have you decided, by the way? Have you made that decision? Are you, are you going to do it no, or not? See, it's not, a, as I said, no, this is a process. We're going through the process. Semiconductor is not about capital alone. Semiconductor is about not ecosystem. Things. We have to worry about the material. We have to worry about all the ecosystem players. You have to bring the entire, entire uh, group together. Yeah. So the, that's where the that's where it is complex. But once the first one is set up, automatically the second, third, one, fourth one, it will become. So you're not going to be the first everything. one. <laughs> no headlines. Shirin, you are paid to ask questions. I'm paid not to answer. <laughs> Okay. I, so, I, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> so, so I think export is a huge opportunity. It will play out. And I'll tell you there are two or three other opportunities. What India will do in healthcare, potentially, mm. between the government programs and the way the private, private sector can follow the, I call it digital, uh, methods to skill, no skill, low skill people to completely transform the healthcare services delivery, especially in primary mm. care. Yeah. I think we will be the example for the rest of the world, both developed and developing, if we pull it off. We have the potential to pull it off, but we are not there. We've got to, we've got to pull it off. The second sector, care sector, mm. we are going to need tremendous amount of focus on the care sector. It will create so much jobs and so many adult population we are going to have and that's going to be a huge business and that actually using the digital technology will be again an opportunity to serve the world. You take tourism sector, you hardly get 10 million tourists. India should be at least getting 100 million tourists. And you do the math, yes. if, uh, if 100 million tourists, one week, $1,000 spent per day, $5,000, you do the math. <coughs> that's the potential, but all that, will come once the infrastructure gets developed. Mm. And the government program and the air, airports, I think 26 airports are, yeah. uh, I don't know what the, what the number is, so many airports are coming in. And investment in rail, in, investment in uh, surface transportation, shipping, all of these things will play out. So I think we should not see it as the next five years, 10 years, but if you take it, the Amrit call, <laughs> the, the, the 25 years, if you take the next 25 years, I think a lot is going to happen and we are, we are going to be fortunate to play a part and witness all of this happen. Mm -hmm. I am very confident, but we are going to execute. We are going to execute, execute, execute. Uh, Minister Rani, I want you to build on that. Some of the opportunities that Chandra spoke of, as well as some of the unrealized potential, and that gap is fairly large and that is what the aspiration is that we will be able to uh, bridge that gap. On areas like healthcare, on areas like the care economy, in the context of can India actually deliver on the aspiration of becoming the workforce for the world, what next can we expect? What, is, what are the priorities? I think that um, if you just take one tenant of what Chandra professed with regards to our export potential, and if, as he says, we fire off and execute from a rural perspective, what are our prospects? So uh, let me, apart from health, dip into one very basic work ethic. We have seen in the history of our country that when you do a rural employment guarantee program, there is a work ethic which says you show up, you sign, and you'll get that money. What Prime Minister Modi did was you show up, 
you build capital assets for the rural infrastructure story. You get the money and you keep showing up. We keep building that infrastructure at the grassroots and the story goes on. Apart from health, and let me just uh, bring your attention to a ministry called the Cooperative Affairs Ministry. Mm. The Cooperative Ministry, just a week and a half uh, ago, pronounced three very ambitious plans. But as you know, Prime Minister Modi, once he announces it, he ensures that he meets the goals that have been set. What are those plans about? They are a reflection of exactly what Chandra says. How do you fire up the export potential of your agronomic society, where you're not focused only on agro-processing, but you also take it a bit earlier than that and look at pre-processing opportunities, which means what you're telling the world is in India, investment opportunities exist not only amongst the big players, but we are creating opportunities mm -hmm. at the grassroots also. What is the work ethic apart from building capital assets that we have seen? Again, apart from health, let me give you the story of the self-help groups. Mm. Now, people would presume that this is a coalition and a congregation of 87 million women who possibly don't know how to totter around financial services. But the reality is that they are managing a credit fund worth between 32 to $35 billion every year. And they're bringing a unique skill set by becoming a part of the rural supply chain. Can we fire that up and complement it with our export potential in agriculture? Absolutely, we can. They say data is the new oil. What is the reserve that India is sitting on? If I again reflect on Chandra's healthcare potential, Ayushman Bharat services 100 million families. If there is four persons per family, that means just our very rudimentary health plan services 400 million Indians and services them through physical infrastructure and digital services. We are the one nation which can, if I talk about the gender perspective, while we are talking vaccines, what is that silent revolution that is happening, which can be complemented by investments from pharmaceutical companies? We've had in the past one and a half years, over 100 million women from poor stratas of society go to a medical institution, brick and mortar, across the country, get themselves tested for cancer of the cervix and breast cancer unimaginable because people presume that culturally this is not an acceptable term of conversation especially publicly amongst Indian women but what we have expressed is that when we have an access to a service and when that access is also economical we know how to use that service so we've created that case for the world to reflect on that as consumers irrespective of whether you think our rural landscape has the potential or not, we have the intelligence to use the digital services or the healthcare brick and mortar services and bring about a huge churn. So when we talk about delivery of free food to 800 million people, what we never reflect on is that for the past two and a half years, there has been a consistent administrative performance of going to the doorstep of 800 million people, which has not happened in any part of the world. That shows not only tech prowess, but it shows the human potential of India. We have the potential, and Chandra is right, that one of the big transition strategies is based on skill. In India, is it only based on dissemination of skill to a segment of population, or is it that tenacity, the audacity of the average Indian to repurpose their skill to address a challenge. Short story, in India by February, when we were hit by the pandemic, India had only an import supply of 55,000 PPE suits. We did not have raw material, we did not have machinery, and we had zero companies. March, when WHO had just pronounced the standards, industry got together with government and said, we do not have a single lab to test it. How do we work? Global supply chains had shut down and PP suits were at premium. People were literally fighting on every one shipment. What did India do? In one month, <coughs> Indian industry and government turned around 11 labs in the country with high technology and serviced by the digital, I think, part of yeah. the industry capacity. 11 labs in one month. We did not dilute WHO standards. 
and we repurposed our manufacturing in the apparel sector. And suddenly, from zero companies, in just one and a half months, we went to 1,100 companies. And in three months, we became the second largest exporters of PPE suits in the world, and at frugal costs. And that is why I say, why do I support what Chandra says about the India plus one story? We knew there is an economics to the pandemic, but we did not profit from it. We repurposed our skills, our manufacturing base, and we did things that nobody in decades thought possible. That is the India story. Well, I, I think you, you've made that very impassioned plea about telling the India story. So let me throw it open to the audience here. I'm sure many have questions. Uh, yes, uh, sir, go ahead. There's a microphone coming to you. Hi, uh, I'm Ian Lindsay, an advisor to the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, I actually led an investment mission into India in June of this year, uh, visiting Delhi, Mumbai, and Hyderabad, and the splendidly named Cyberabad in Hyderabad. Um, ministers, you've talked earlier about potential, huge potential, but also India is already there. You're now the fifth largest economy in the world. You're the largest democracy in the world. And of course, you're chairing the G20 this year. Um, and we heard earlier from Chandra at the CII Deloitte's breakfast uh, that the, you've got your B20. What I think would be quite good to hear is you've talked about exports, but what does India bring to the table? To quote you, your Excellency Minister, earlier, what does India bring to the table on international business now that you are up there uh, as having achieved um, economic strength? Uh, that's, I think, what I'd like very much to hear from the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you want to bring both of you, why don't you start? And so, <clears throat> one thing that we would definitely like to offer to the world is the India stack. Now, India stack, if we understand it, uh, there, is, there was one approach where government was doing everything. I won't take any names. Government would like to control everything. Government would like to do everything in that particular geography. There is another approach where a few big tech, they monopolized everything. We in India in 2016 launched a totally new concept, which is public digital platforms, where the government invested in creating the platform, and then anybody can join it. For example, the payment platform. Uh, more than 300 <coughs> banks have joined it. More than 1.2 billion people are using it. Hundreds and hundreds of startups are using it. So that kind of concept, and it's all open source, to, to the point, what can India offer to the international uh, business? This is an open source, available to everybody. Already 13 countries have signed MOUs with us. And uh, we'd be very happy to offer it to the world. And again, as Minister Irani said, this is not for profit. This is purely our soft contribution to the world. Minister Irani. Just to, um, I want to add, but you can, yeah. you can speak. I just want to just compliment what my uh, colleague says. I think that when you talk about the G20 presidency especially, as Prime Minister Modi has enunciated, what is it that we seek to contribute to? There's a difference between saying what do we seek to lead and what do we seek to contribute to? And that is why the theme is one world, one future. And a part of that future is also climate change. Do you look at climate change from a responsibility perspective or do you look at it from an investment perspective? We have in India pronounced the largest hydrogen mission in the world, but also we are home to the International Solar Alliance. We are home to the Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Till now, the disaster res uh, resilient infrastructure in India is domestically funded. But as Minister Vaishnav says, we are also using our technology to help give that support to mitigate climate change to nations which cannot afford that technology. Prime Minister Modi has opened up the space sector, but now we lead ISRO and its collaborative efforts with many a countries who cannot afford that kind of a space program to specially combat climate change. Is that a humanitarian opportunity? Yes, but it's also an investment opportunity. Chandra? May I? Yes, please. I think this one has to be seen slightly differently from my point of view. Um, you said India is already up there. I think, yes, we are the fifth largest uh, economy, but we are not there yet because we, uh, we have a long way to go. We will have to address the per capita income to a different level from where we are now. And uh, I can give you 100 other metrics. But having said that, what India brings to the table and can offer the world is, please look at the way India is solving its problems. 
whether it's a vaccination problem or whether it is digitally connecting every citizen. By doing this, what we have done is we have enabled the formalization of economy. What this is going to result in is almost 200 to 300 million additional people coming into the formal economy. People always ask if the technology is going to, is going to come in such a way we will take our jobs. No, because technology is going to enable so many people come into the market and participate in, in the market. And that is going to drive phenomenal growth. So our solutions, you have to see India as building solutions to solve a problem. It is not technology. It is not one policy. It is a policy, uh, technology, and other private sector participation, ecosystem development. That's how it has gone about it, whether it is. You know, I'm connecting the dots uh, backwards. If you had asked me three years ago, four years ago, I couldn't have articulated it. And that India can offer. And it, 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 it may be tech stacks. Originally, we created a simple horizontal mm. stack, which was Aadhaar, unique identifier. Then we had the payment stack. Yeah. Now we are getting into vertical stacks. There is a healthcare stack that is getting developed. And all this is open architecture. People can build business models on top of it. But the advantage of doing this is the big ticket cost of creating the backbone infrastructure, be it software or whatever it is, it is done once. If every private sector company is building it, first of all, you will put a lot of money, first of all. Right. Second thing is, systems won't talk to each other. And it will take a lot of time. Uh, so, so I think there are many examples, but for the want of time, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, unfortunately, we're completely out of time. I know you have a question. Can we take one last question? Yes, ma'am, go ahead, please. Yes, we'll... You've got a microphone, please. Oh, I have quite a loud voice, though. Um, we are a federation of 110 primary collective businesses of women. Very much appreciate what the Honorable Ministers and Chandra said and very much support our government's efforts. But I would also like to ask what we can do more or whether we can work together, government, private sector, and those of us working at the grassroots, to develop a fund which will support women's collective enterprises and unleash their full potential. And the second, if we can recognize the care economy and the huge inputs and significant impact that we are giving. In fact, the informal economy, as we know, is 90% of the Indian workforce yes. and we're 55% of Indian GDP. Right. So how can we develop the care economy more so that women's full economic potential is unleashed. Well, thank you very much for asking that question. And I think that is the perfect conclusion that we could have hoped for. So, Minister Rani, I'm going to give you the final say. I'll, uh, I'll just be very short in my response. The Indian government every year gives an outlay of one lakh crore plus to only those coalitions of women across the country. These are the 87 million women I speak of. And that money is given to manage credit, but also economic activity. And as Chandra says, where is the skill opportunity? Not only upskilling, reskilling, but the entry level skill opportunity. If today I would look at the investment prospects and need, as a woman, I'm not speaking as a minister, what is the future like which is better for Indian women? We have had a lot of entry-level excitement in the SME segment with regards to women-led businesses. Mudra Yojana, when it was pronounced, was not a gendered financial service. 320 million business loans given out for SME, and 70% of the offtake has been by women. And that is what shocked many people. That means that in the rural landscape, in the urban poor areas, it was the woman who drew up a business plan, went to a bank, convinced that bank of her business plan, not only took that credit, but returned it because our NPAs for women-led businesses is less than 1% or about less, less, uh, yeah. uh, less than 2%. What is my ask as a woman of Indian funds or international funds? Help transition women who are in the SME segment to mid-sized companies or who are doing well in mid-sized companies, not leading administratively, but owning that business help them transition into large corporations. 
because every time you enhance a woman's economic power, she spends more on healthcare, she spends more in education, yeah. and she fuels those aspects of the economy, which Chandra is very gung-ho about. But <laughs> if you make sure that that transition happens from the SME segment yes. to not only big corporation, but even mid-size, that is the revolution India is waiting for. Absolutely. That is clearly one of the very important revolutions that we must ensure uh, is unleashed because uh, to truly unlock the power of the economy, we need to unlock the power of India's women as well. Uh, Minister Vaishnav, Minister Irani uh, and Chandrasekharan, many, many thanks for joining us here to give us your insights on what the India story looks like and more importantly, where the India story is headed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon. Appreciate your time.